I'm interested to hear you expand a little bit more on is when you talked about the like the Trinity concept. Yeah, you mentioned that in in one of your videos. I think that that would be really interesting to hear a little bit. Yeah, more the about. iceberg of finance. This was so I when I did my semester abroad in Italy back when I was in college. This was probably the most useful thing I learned because I never heard of this before, and it's surprise. It's talked about in in professional investment circles. A lot because a lot of people trade on monetary policy, but really outside of that, it's kind of an obscure idea and it doesn't just apply to markets. It applies to life too, in a lot of circumstances. And you have three possible things you want to do, but due to just the, but you can't form a straight line between all three points. That's why it's a triangle. And so you have to take two. And in the case of economics, the impossible trinity is independent monetary policy so you can set interest rates at whatever levels you want or do as much you can have free movement of capital which is the ability to move money in and out of a country without any sort of barriers and allow your currency to just to be everywhere and then the third one is a fixed exchange rate so that like no matter what you do your the dollar is always going to be worth say one euro hypothetically in this example right. you can't you you only can pick two because if you because you can ideally you'd want all three you want the stability of a fixed exchange rate system because even though there are some people who make money trading forex the uncertainty of currency risk and the cost of hedging is a real burden to society on the aggregate you've got the people want the freedom to have monetary policy however they want whether it's to keep their inflation down or to finance a, a more expansionary fiscal policy or whatever it means like governments like the freedom to be able to do what they want for that people like the idea of free capital movement because if you have free capital movement foreigners are more likely to want to invest in your country and more foreign investment particularly foreign direct investment is generally a good thing for economic growth and also it makes your currency perceived as more trustworthy so people will denominate mm -hmm. trade in your currency. The problem is that these are fundamentally incompatible. If you want a fixed exchange rate, if you have free movement of capital, people are going to are going to flee and move out of, of your country, move their money out to a more stable currency. So like say for example, you have the government deciding, "Oh, we're going to lower interest rates to zero to finance a bunch of infrastructure and therefore the the currency is going to probably be devalued at least at home if you're smart like look what's going on in japan and the yen right now right. they're printing a bunch of money and they're not tightening monetary policy enough to justify their free movement of capital the yen is free falling it and it, they're all, and it's going to keep free falling until they tighten their fiscal or monetary policy worse compared to the dollar in 120 120 years is that right well yeah i mean i'm just talking about the last two years I mean, <laughs> but in the last few years it's gone from like 125 range to 160. Yeah. It's there's been a major devaluation in the end because of this. They have interest rates at near zero. They, they finally brought one above zero a few months ago. And the rest of the world is at four or five percent. So what are you gonna do? You're gonna borrow in yen, or you're just, if you have a bunch of yen, you're gonna put it in a bank account somewhere else, collect that five percent, but those, those transactions lower the value of your currency All right. as the capital flight out. So if you want independent monetary policy and a stable exchange rate, you have to lock people in. A, a country that does that, for example, is China. There are certain exemptions, but individuals are, for example, are not allowed to take more than $50,000 out of China in a given year. There's a lot of capital controls, and that's how they're able to maintain an independent monetary policy and have a fixed ex relatively. It's not, it's, it's, it, it's, now based on the SDR basket versus just the US dollar directly. So that's why it moves a little bit. It's semi-fixed, but they have a relatively fixed exchange rate because they have restricted capital um, controls. And the, the second link, say they, for example, you don't, you want the fixed exchange rate and you want free movement of capital. An like example of this would be Hong Kong. You have to sacrifice having an independent monetary policy. The Hong Kong dollar has a narrow peg um, to the USD. It's like 7.75 to 7.85 HKD to the US dollar. The way they, and they have free, you can freely move money in and out of Hong Kong. And the reason that they can be able to do that is because they've given up on independent monetary policy. Basically their interest rate policy and their relative liquidity in their system has to copy the Fed because 
if they don't, then they're going to lose that fixed exchange rate with the dollar and the currency peg will break. This is what happened in the Asian financial crisis in the late 1990s. A lot of countries that had fixed pegs to the dollar broke. This is how George Soros broke the pound in 1991 because they had a fixed exchange rate, but their monetary policy wasn't really lined up with that. And so right. the speculators were able to break the currency because they couldn't keep that fixed exchange rate anymore. So you, if you want the fixed exchange rate and free movement of capital, like in those cases, you have to have a very, you have to copy the monetary policy of whoever you're paying. And then when you dollarize, which is when a country like, example, like Panama or Ecuador and Argentina is trying to do, you basically just have the Fed's monetary policy by default because you're not using your own currency anymore. And so you have the free movement of the US dollar, but you have no more control. And for countries that have bad fiscal policy history or don't have a discipline of a strong central bank, it's probably a better alternative than having a home central bank. But mm -hmm. there is a cost and that's you can't have your own monetary policy. Mm -hmm. And then the third one is of the Trinity is if you want fiscal freedom and free movement of capital, then you sacrifice the fixed exchange rate. And that's what most of the world has. Like most countries have independent monetary policies. Most countries, relatively free movement of capital, the US, the EU, the EU is fixed within its within the member states, but I'm talking about internationally. The UK, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, and most international currencies of they 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 have you can move money freely between them, and they have their own independent central banks. That's why different countries have different interest rate policies and have different levels of inflation and different fiscal policies. Because but the sacrifice they're making is that their currency exchange rate changes every day. That's why the dollar's exchange rate changes every second on the fourth yeah. it's because right. the market is pricing in differences in these policies. There's other factors that drive effects like trade flows and supply of natural resources affecting your fiscal and trade and current account deficits. But just to make things simple, the biggest driver is in monetary policy and interest rate differentials between countries and what those are going to look like in the future. And so that's why currencies move. So the, 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 the reason, that, again, it's an impossible trinity is you can't have all three. You have to pick two. And as we've seen with the examples I've mentioned, different countries have picked different two points. And you can apply this to anything else in life. It's just that, that where there are three ideal choices, but you have to pick two. But the impossible trinity is the most quantifiable and economically useful example of that. That was really interesting. So I really appreciate you, you breaking that down.